In the world of video games, whenever you see a successful franchise deciding to do spin-offs, it can lead to questions of the game steering too far from what the series was originally about. Metal Gear is no different when it comes to receiving its fair share of spin-offs. There's been games that have all done drastically different things with the franchise, from character action game, to a strategy card game, to even a wave-based cover shooter. On this channel, I've already covered two games that could be considered a spin-off game of Metal Gear, except these have been focused heavily on multiplayer, and now we're going to look at a third multiplayer Metal Gear spin-off title, with this one probably being the weirdest one yet. I'm talking, of course, about Metal Gear Arcade. What the hell? The year was 2009. MGS4 had come out a year earlier, and so the expectation for what Konami and Kojima had in store for E3 that year was pretty high. And Kojima delivered by announcing several new projects. I want, I want this new E3 to be a big success. So even though it might be too early to show, I brought something very, uh, very special, special for you. I am pleased to present you with two, no, I'll make that four new titles today. This would be the first look we would get of Peace Walker and Rising. Well, before it became Revengeance anyway. But that wasn't all Kojima had to show. They dedicated a portion of the showcase to reveal a new title called Metal Gear Arcade. Metal Gear Solid finally makes its appearance to the coin ops. As you see, Metal Gear Arcade. This showcase was very out of place because it was supposed to be a Japan exclusive game. The picture you see here is the Japanese version machine, so uh, for the overseas version, uh, we're not sure, but we're still working on that. So, revealing it at a North American E3 press conference was a weird choice to say the least. They didn't even know what the game would look like in the West yet. It's coming back from the PS3's Metal Gear Online. That was quite a hit, so we're going to bring it to the coin ops. So what was Metal Gear Arcade? Metal Gear Arcade was a repackaging of MGS4's Metal Gear Online, retooled to be turned into a stereoscopic 3D tactical shooter experience. All with a new fancy new light gun design as well. Basically, they took all of MGO2's assets changed the controls around, and added a 3D filter on it, because that was all the rage at the time. At the time this was announced, MGO2 was considered a success, but as I covered on my MGO2 video, the game ended up shutting down in 2012 due to dwindling player numbers at the time, and a growing cheating problem. Its arcade counterpart did not seem to have better luck either. While in Japan, MGO and by extension arcade were very popular, with hugely dedicated communities, it apparently wasn't enough to keep the service going, with arcades in Japan ending up removing the cabinets as the years went on, which also meant its western release never ended up happening, and it eventually shut down its servers in 2016. So after this initial announcement, not only did MGO2 not get much in terms of support after 2009, but there was never an official word about arcade in the west since then, and eventually, both games ended up being shut down and faded into obscurity. That was the history of these games up until now, but thanks to a dedicated community, not only was MGO2 brought back, but so was Arcade made playable again, thanks to emulation. The problem is that this game was entirely online, and while you could play it offline, if you wanted to save your progress, you needed to be able to connect to the game's servers. This meant that a lot of the game's content was just left inaccessible unless you were really dedicated to the game. It also meant you could only play against bots. But thanks to community member Zoft, there is progress being made so that there is now a community server available, and you can create an account and save your progress now. Even the original website is fully restored, where you can see everything that happened during the game's life, like events and special promotions, and maybe in the future be able to potentially matchmake with other players as well. So for the first time ever, we get to fully see what this game had to offer. 
So please, come join me as we dive into the forgotten game of Metal Gear Arcade. The device you're wearing over your left eye is the solid eye. 3D glasses, huh? Before you even get to the game, you're greeted by this screen. To launch the game, you need to activate the settings menu with a specific button that you can map, and then go all the way to game mode and hit start. That brings up the opening sequence of the game. The title screen just flashes a bunch of 3D images at you, where the actual arcade machine would have actually played a few videos to try and attract players to play the game by showing off gameplay and the 3D goggles and the light gun. This being the emulator version though, the game crashes if you linger too long on the start screen. So we're gonna go ahead and actually put in a credit to continue. Getting past the title screen, this is when you're prompted to use your Konami E amusement pass. Without the servers being online, this part would actually be entirely skipped. But now we can actually go ahead and make an account thanks to the community server. E amusement pass was a common card that could be used for Konami related machines and products. This is how you would save your data for Metal Gear Arcade, and they would sell them in arcades where the machines were located. If your phone was capable of paying for things electronically, you could also use that as your e-amusement pass, but I don't have much more information on how that works beyond that, unfortunately. If you lost your physical card, though, you were screwed unless you remembered the 16-digit code that was on the back of the card, and you need to have a Konami ID to register that card and be able to transfer the data from there. Even in the arcade world, there's no escaping that damn Konami ID. We don't need an actual card nowadays though. You can emulate a fake one and use that to register your account. Once that account is created, you're brought to the character creator. The character creator is the same as it was in MGO2, with male and female options and all the voice and face options too. One tidbit I'd like to point out is that whenever you make a new character, it always starts with this forest green camo setup, which makes sense considering that forest green was usually the main color that would stand out in most of the MGS forest maps. Once you create a character, every time you play the game, you have to turn your credits into MG coins. So the game uses this currency for pretty much everything. You use it to play the game, you use it to buy things for your character, hell, you even use it to buy more time in the menus. I wish I was kidding about that one. Really starting to understand why this wasn't popular at arcades now. So now that you have your MG coins, you're brought to the main screen where we can have an overview of everything that's available. From this screen, you can see your name and rank and the mode selection menu. First one is network battle, which is as it sounds, it's the main multiplayer of the game. Since matchmaking doesn't work here though, you mainly get paired with bots. Right under that is trial match, this lets you also play against bots intentionally, but it's a lot more forgiving. They are generally a lot easier, and you can see enemies through walls. It's very useful when starting out. Mission mode is where you can play single player or co-op oriented missions. There are a lot of different types of missions, and they aren't that mind blowing or anything, but they let you really have fun with all the different types of weapons that are available in the game. It's also where the bulk of the content of this game can be found, since you're going to be trying to S rank every mission. It will take a while for some of them, and others will be really challenging. Especially since co-op missions also require matchmaking to work, you're mainly going to be doing those solo. On the final row, you have your customization menu where you can edit your character and controls, as well as buying new weapons and gear. And then the tutorial is right next to that, and it's always available for the first time you play. It teaches you the basics, and you go over general actions you would be doing in the game. Seeing gameplay of people playing this though, it really seems that it wasn't actually that simple for people to get the hang of. Now you're familiar with the modes available in the menu, let's dive into the modes in detail. The tutorial is both really important and not important here, because we're sort of playing this on a keyboard and mouse, the tutorial is good for mapping your controls and getting used to the game before diving in. As far as the tutorial itself, it teaches you what each button on the light gun does as well as the differences between head control and gun control modes. Head control just means that you use the goggles on your head to move the camera. 
So you'd look to the edge of the screen in order to move it in that particular direction. Gun control is doing the exact same thing, but with aiming the light gun towards the edge of the screen instead. They both have their advantages and disadvantages, but since we're not playing on an actual arcade machine, it's best to use gun control, because that way you can use your mouse instead to control the camera. The tutorial guides you through general actions you can perform, like shooting and reloading and things like that. If you played MGS4 or MGO, then you should be right at home. At the end of the day, this game is literally just MGS4 with an arcade coat of paint, and while the gun control might take a bit getting used to, if you're playing on mouse and keyboard, it shouldn't take that long to familiarize yourself and get the hang of things. After going through all the game's mechanics, the tutorial will then let you hit targets for the remaining time you have left, so that you can go through and actually put all these things into practice. And after you're done, you're taken back to the menu and you see that the tutorial option is completely blanked out, meaning that you cannot access it again for the remainder of that session. Customization is worth diving into because in order to explain the intricacies of the game's combat, I'll need to break down just what's important about customizing your character. In this menu, you can buy and equip guns and equipment, as well as check your overall stats. To keep things simple, we will focus on just the gear customization for now and cover weapons a bit later. Unlike the game's predecessor, Metal Gear Online 2, the gear here is not cosmetic. They actually affect your stats in various ways. The translation of this might be a bit messy, but after extensive testing, this is how I ended up naming all these different skills. You have attack up for increasing damage, weapon mastery for increased proficiency, Think of stuff like reload speed and weapon handling and stuff like that, like recoil. Defense up is just damage mitigation. Movement up is speed increase or runner if you're familiar with MGO2. And the rest of these is just resistances to headshots, explosives, smokes, and fire respectively. Now the gauges above are a bit trickier. I'm not sure what weight affects since movement speed is tied to the runner skill, the same as MGO2. But from what I can tell, the higher these bars are, the more resistance you are to the flinching mechanic. If you don't understand what flinching is, I think it's best I use MGO2 to explain this one. In MGS4, certain things can stun your character for a few seconds represented in-game by an animation that looks a lot like a flinch. So things like rolling or being shot in the neck can cause this animation to happen. Even further, things like shotguns, the CQC melee combo, as well as other specific interactions like being rolled into while in crouch can cause a knockdown animation. In both of these instances, you cannot move and cannot perform an action until the animation is done. MGO2 gave you a skill called Toughness, which depending on its level, gave you an increasing level of resistance. Level 1 stops flinching, level 2 stops knockdowns, and level 3 stops ragdolling. In arcade though, this skill has been split up across all the gear you can equip. You essentially can build resistance to whatever causes these flinching animations by equipping specific types of gear, so you have a chance to not flinch or straight up be immune to knockdowns depending on your defensive gauge and the resistance can vary from various parts of the body as represented here. Now I am willing to admit after saying all that, I may be wrong about how this stuff worked. There's not a lot of available documentation on this that breaks this system down, so I'm just going off of what I can notice in gameplay, so I can't give much more specifics on how this stuff works other than what I've just laid out for you. So there may be more things involved here that I'm not able to notice. But this was the most obvious I was able to pick up on after playing the game for several hours. I gotta admit though, this is easily the single change I am not too much of a fan of, because this changes the value of the cosmetics in a way that doesn't really help the game that much. Compared to MGO2, it's taking the skill system and making it even more vague by just tying it to particular items. Now, if they somehow combined these two systems and kept physical skills tied to gear and SOP related skills tied to the skill slots, I could see it working a little bit better, giving you access to way more skill combinations than you did in MGO2. 
but I still prefer cosmetic items not affecting gameplay at all, so you can look how you want and not need to compromise on it. Especially when the difference ain't that big to really get the most out of it. It makes you question just what exactly the goal was when trying to make this cosmetic system. All I know though is that I prefer to keep things cosmetic from here on out. Trial Match is a mock battle with AI on the easiest difficulty, as in they wear no armor and use basic weapons, and you can see everyone through walls. The matches are also much shorter than network matches. As you'd expect, this is where you can test your weapons and gear, since the enemies are not using any gear that would modify their damage. So everything is at its base values. With the matches being short, you can quickly test loadouts and gear combinations. And this is where I mainly started testing different builds and different gear setups to see the effectiveness of each and every possible gameplay option that you could possibly play. We'll get a little bit more into it when I start going into the weapons, but overall, this is a very good mode to use if you just want to practice and get a feel for certain builds. <laughs> Network Match, aside from being able to play with other players, has AI that also increase in difficulty as you progress in the game's leveling system. They wear better armor, use higher grade weapons, and on top of having all that, have better reaction time and accuracy. Both Network Battle and Trial Match are usually just team death matches, but there are some unique things that Arcade did that never seem to have seen the light of day. Whenever two players of high rank fight each other, they oftentimes enter a thing called a special battle. The whole point of the special battle is to track each other's kills and to see who performs the best from the two. Based on that performance, that's where you would get an animal rank. Animal ranks are important for MGO and they have been a staple for the game ever since the beginning. MGO1 has animal ranks, MGO2 has them, even MGO3 ended up having its own system required for animal ranks, but they don't work the same as they do in Metal Gear Arcade. The reason I say this kind of stuff never happened for Metal Gear Arcade though is because based on the information we have from the website, no one ever got to a high enough rank in the requirements to even trigger this event to happen. Granted, the website only shows the leaderboard for as far back as 2011, so there may be more to it than that since the game kept the servers going up until 2016. So safe to say, I may be wrong on this one. And yeah, it does seem I was wrong. I got corrected on this information and was shown that a dedicated community of players would gather at specific arcades to do things like clan battles or even unofficial tournaments while also being good enough at the game to trigger these special battles. The website itself has tons of videos from 2012 to 2014. But nevertheless, it is something different this game did when it came to how animal ranks were distributed. Comparing it to MGO2 or even 3, animal ranks were given out on a weekly basis based on if you met the criteria for achieving them. Stuff like getting a lot of headshots or using the box for a certain amount of time. There are a lot of harder ones to get of course, but hopefully you get my point. It never involved you having a high rank first and then facing another person in battle for it. It goes to show the subtle differences that they did for Metal Gear Arcade to keep things interesting to the people playing it, even if the most dedicated of players would ever get those ranks. Mission Mode has a bunch of single player and co-op content that you can complete and get a ranking for. The missions vary from shooting targets, killing a certain number of enemies with certain versions of the missions giving you limited lives, defending a base from being captured, and sneaking around a snake and get to the goal without being spotted. Aside from sneaking mission, a lot of these missions have modifiers where they restrict you to using specific weapons, and you are put on various of the different maps that exist within the game, with these conditions getting harder as you progress through the different variations of the missions. However, this game also has single player and co-op missions, so since you can't matchmake, the co-op missions are done solo, and can be a little bit more challenging than the regular missions just because of that alone. 
The co-op missions don't have anything that particularly exclusive to them. They all have the exact same criteria. It's just that you get to do some with more people than the single player ones. The good thing about these missions is that you get to play through all the maps and use weapons that you may or may not have unlocked yet. And then you get to also go for S ranks. So far, I've been able to complete most of these missions with an S rank, but the hardest one so far has to be definitely anything involving using CQC. The one CQC mission I'm stuck on is where you only have 5 lives and you have to eliminate a few enemies using just CQC. The AI here is ruthless because the game ain't that much of a stealth game. I know, I know, shocking. Maybe you will have a better chance at completing this challenge than I did. But just taking a look at the gameplay, it's very easy to see how I struggled. The AI can just detect you no matter where you are, and they just turn at the most random times. And unless you actually get behind these enemies, CQC will not actually kill them in one slam. You have to do it multiple times. But with all that being said, that covers all the content that this game has to offer. So let's get into the kind of weapons you will have access to and how combat in Metal Gear Arcade works. The combat of MGA is very simple compared to the other MGOs. Not just in the fact that it's a light gun shooter, but in the complexity of the equipment available to you too. Non-lethal weapons are straight up not a thing here. So weapons that would normally KO instead of kill, like the Mosin Nagant or CQC, can just straight up kill the opponent now. When it comes to your standard equipment, you have your primary, secondary, and support options. The guns available are all familiar if you actually played Metal Gear Solid 4, but even if you didn't, a lot of the guns will be very familiar if you played any modern shooter. The way they have been balanced though is a bit unique to even MGO2 since all the guns are capable of making you flinch now. This is where all the armor comes into play that I mentioned earlier as you can be resistant to flinching from certain types, and you're gonna need a high amount of defensive stats to be able to resist knockdowns from shotguns or even the Mosin Nagant. But let's go through all the different weapon classes. Assault rifles have decent damage and medium range at the cost of having higher bloom and recoil. They can all flinch pretty regularly at medium range as well. SMGs have short range, which means to flinch people, you need to be very close. But with the high fire rate, there's a higher chance for it to happen per bullet, making them very hard to deal with at close range. Shotguns get to straight up knock people down when shooting, and their fire rate is insane, which allows for guaranteed follow-up shots. And if they're not close enough to knock down, they can still flinch, which allows them to bridge that gap. Snipers have the most variation here because you have bolt action, semi-auto, and full auto options, making snipers work very differently across the board with each type that you choose. The Mosin Nagan is very notable here because compared to MGO2, it's way stronger. It has the capacity to knock people down at any range similar to a shotgun, which can also allow for follow-up shots. If you get hit by the sniper, you're pretty much at the mercy of the guy that shot you and hope that he misses his next shot. Side note, this makes the Mosin Nagant about as strong as it was in MGS3 versus the end, where getting shot by it felt like getting hit by a truck. Pistols are solid backups, where they don't do a ton of damage on their own, but they can stun people pretty regularly, if you can land a headshot, which thanks to their solid accuracy, allows for quick follow-up shots. If you don't want a pistol, you can use CQC or a knife in your secondary slot. With CQC, you can grab people from behind and choke them out, or slam them if you're in front of them. With the knife, you can do a 5-hit slash combo or a 1-hit kill stab. The 1-hit kill potential of the knife, though, does make it seem way better than CQC. But you do have to manually aim the knife to do it. So, depending on your level of execution, it might determine which option is better for you. And of course, neither of these two options have any range, so if you actually want to have any of that, you're better off using a pistol. 
The support weapons are self-explanatory. Grenades can ragdoll enemies and do a ton of damage, while fire grenades do damage over time and they have a way smaller radius. Smoke can actually stun enemies by making them cough. Claymores are very good for area of denial, which is great because the maps are very small, so you can actually control the maps fairly easily. And C4 let you do the same, but manually detonating the explosive, giving you a much bigger explosive radius as well. On the surface, MGA seems like a pretty standard shooter, but the more you understand how it works, it's still very much MGS4 underneath all that. The biggest difference though is that they let you equip special items like stealth camo. You can activate stealth at any time, but it has a limited battery life, and it doesn't recharge, but it lasts quite a while. Just like an MGO though, your weapons are still fully visible. There's other items you can equip like a radar scan, which works very similar to how the radar worked in MGO1, but people with stealth cannot be detected by it. There are more items you can get like the threat ring apparently, which is a mechanic that was used by Snake in MGS4 story mode and sneaking mission in MGO, but it takes a while to unlock, so for the majority of the time, you will mainly have access to these two items in particular. The reason these options seem very strong is because this game actually has a health regeneration mechanic. It happens the moment you're out of combat, but your max health is always being reduced the more damage you're sustaining. Add to all this the fact that the character customization is also affecting various stats that you might have, and the special items that you can use, and you have a pretty fun shooter in your hands here. It's actually insane how smooth the game plays, at least offline. And with the combat now fully laid out, it's starting to seem very similar to something. Cause I'm having deja vu here. Yeah, a lot of the things Metal Gear Arcade added seem to be the beginning of things we would later see in things like MGO3. Although there's some specific differences that make this version a lot more enjoyable. We went over a lot of the gun combat, but there's a few differences specifically between this game and MGO2 that are downright improvements that make this game a lot more fun to play. First of all, the damage fall off is harsh. You can go from doing full damage to just tickling opponents very quickly, which makes sense because in MGO2, guns were able to be accurate enough that you could literally outsnipe snipers with them. With this one change, weapon classes were more restricted into the ranges that they were meant to be used in. Even with snipers ignoring this little range issue, it didn't mean that they were instantly better, since the defensive stats still helped at making snipers be less of a nuisance, especially since the only one that can actually physically stop somebody was the bolt action, with enough damage to kill. So snipers were viable, but they didn't kill in one shot unless you got rid of most of your good gear in return to actually boost the damage, which I feel was a decent trade-off since the maps are incredibly small, so it's not like snipers are hard to find. Also, with the team size being 4v4, it means that you really do need an even distribution of gun types to cover all ranges, which is why the AI will usually have a sniper on their team all the time. Because the maps are so small, you kind of don't want to be bunched up together, so having people being able to cover different ranges is way better than just having everyone stand in one spot. With a lot of these changes in mind, it really does feel like they managed to balance out the guns available in the game a little bit better than they did for MGO2. Of course, there's only so much I can gleam off of this with the fact that I'm only able to play this offline. That pretty much summarizes Metal Gear Arcade's combat, it's pretty short, intense, and the rules of engagement are pretty strict to follow. So with all that being said, just how is the progression of it all handled anyway? I don't know what you're here for, but you want to be well equipped, am I right? So, can we talk business or what? You won't regret it. If I could explain this game's progression in one word, it would be expensive. Remember that doing anything in this game costs coins. Five credits gets you 210 MG coins, which is the maximum you can hold at one time. 
Every time you complete a mission, you get experience based on your performance, and you can level up once you have enough experience. Sounds simple enough, every other game does this, right? But they decided to keep the leveling system exactly the same as MGO2, meaning you can actually de-level if you get low enough. The thing about this though is that it's not exactly like MGO2, where the level requirements are actually a lot bigger this time around, so it takes a while to not only level up, but it also takes a while to level down. You're not losing tons of experience just because you played badly one game. Another bonus is that there's tons of ranks to get through. This game doesn't use a numbered system, it uses a actual grading system, so you go from D rank and you have to level up until you can go up to the next grade. So what do you get for leveling up? Well, for one, you do unlock weapons and gear based on your level, but it's not like you just get them, it's more like you unlock the ability to buy them. But you can't just buy them with MG coins, you need to get this other thing called tickets. Tickets are given to you at the end of every game you play, and are given to you randomly. There are three types of tickets, bronze, silver, and gold. Yeah, platinum tickets are there too, but I have no idea what they're used for. This is where the true grind of the game is, because every item in the game has a MG coin and ticket requirement to purchase them. And I don't mean that in the sense that as long as you meet the criteria for one of them, you can buy it. No, you have to meet all the criteria. So if there's an item requiring 20 MG coins, five bronze tickets, three silver and one gold, you better have all of the currency exactly or else you can't buy the item. The prices for these items can get downright ridiculous for higher level items too. I couldn't imagine playing this game for real and trying to earn all these items legitimately because the prices are that high for some of them. Especially since this would be happening at an actual arcade, the amount of time it would take you just to get to the level requirements would definitely not be possible with the amount of money it would cost just to play the game that much. And that's without actually buying any items for the character. Remember, it costs money to play this game, just in general. It's a really good thing we have unlimited credits when playing on this emulator because I don't think I would have gotten as far as I have if I hadn't. Brother, it's been too long. Liquid. Rejoice! We're not copies of our father after all. Normally this is where a lot of the information about the game would end, but this game has something very unique about it. Because it is MGO2 Repackage, there are a lot more things we can directly compare between both games. And since I have a ton of knowledge on how MGO2 works, I figured it would be cool just to directly compare all the differences between Metal Gear Arcade and Metal Gear Online 2. We can go from least important to most important. Fall damage is not as severe here. You can take about 25% HP, while in MGO2 you would take up to half of your health, or even just die if you just jumped from too high up. Metal Gear Arcade doesn't have that type of condition. You can actually jump from any height in the game and not die from fall damage. And because of the health regeneration, you kind of just regain all that health anyway. Uh, spawn invincibility was shortened, but you can still shoot your gun and retain the invincibility. In MGO2, you would lose it the moment you would do anything like aim your gun or even doing a roll. This would have been nice to have an MGO2 just because it would prevent spawn camping. General movement speed has been improved. While the movement speed between MGO2 and Arcade don't seem that much different, the game did receive updates that actually buffed movement speed. You can check the preview videos that were meant to attract players and see that the movement for Arcade was significantly slower at one point. But it's not just the movement speed, even things like rolling and side rolling have all been sped up and given better travel time and faster animation. Looking at them side by side, the increased distance and speed make these maneuvers so much more useful because you can actually use them to get out of firefights 
a lot better than you could in MGO2. Other things that got sped up actually include things like climbing ladders as well as placing traps, which are so much quicker than MGO2, even with the skill to actually place traps faster. And this is just a native thing you can do. You don't need to have a skill to place traps this fast. This is just the normal default speed. Grenades were actually nerfed in this version so that you actually have to be closer to the explosion in order for the ragdolling to actually happen. If you're outside of this range, you actually flinch instead. You also get one less grenade compared to MGO2. Now, if you have played MGO2, you already know how strong grenades are. So this was very much needed. It's too bad MGO2 never got that kind of balancing. Otherwise, the game would be completely different. Now, there's one important change that drastically separates this game from MGO2. And it's something that you wouldn't really think about unless you're very used to both games and understand how both games work. Can you see the difference between these two clips? There is little to no invincibility frames in Metal Gear Arcade where there would be for MGO2. Almost everything that animates the character in MGO2 provides iframes. Flinching, being knocked down, even ragdolling. These iframes basically let you live in situations that you wouldn't be able to normally if they weren't present. And that's what Arcade does. Arcade does away with them, making all these moments when you can't move even more deadlier. A person using a shotgun in MGO2 cannot spam the shots, otherwise they risk shooting while you're still invulnerable, leaving them wide open. Not a problem in Metal Gear Arcade. People ragdolling is also a big problem because not only is there a sinking issue present where they might teleport to a different side than expected, but you also need to time your shots to be right when the invulnerability wears off so that they can die. Play the game long enough and you'll get the timing down, but it's a quirk of the game that honestly didn't even need to be there. The fact that Arcade removes all of this makes it insanely better because it removes the unnecessary time wasted on interactions that would be way more simpler if it just didn't have this to begin with. And that's all I could actually find. Like there might be a lot more intricate things that make this game a little bit more different than Metal Gear Online 2, but this was the most obvious that I could see just by playing the game. Snake, I uh, came across some information in my work. Huh? We found him. If this is where all the juicy things about Metal Gear Arcade would end, I would have been fine with it. But there's still a bit more. Officially, the game only had the first five maps of MGO2 playable, including two new ones never before seen. So the maps that were available were Ambush Alley, Bloodbath, Groznygrad, Midtown Maelstrom, and Urban Ultimatum. With the new maps being Desert Duel and Lethal Leviathan. These two maps have already been ported over to MGO2 thanks to the staff over at Save MGO, but they were first seen in Metal Gear Arcade. There was also a third map that was added into Metal Gear Arcade but not finished, and that was this Eastern Europe map. That's all well and good, but what about the other maps? Well, they're all here too. Yep, each and every one of the maps, including the expansion content for MGO2, are all here. More so than that, some of them also have variations specifically made for Arcade. It's not groundbreaking or anything, a lot of it is just blocking off certain sections using random debris and or barricades, but for some maps, they completely redesign certain sections or even open up new pathways that were previously inaccessible. Silo Sunset and Winter Warehouse are the most noticeable in their changes. SS has the complete middle of the map changed to be way more open by getting rid of certain walls. And WW changes the entire middle section of the map to be completely open as well as adding this new section to blue spawn that wasn't there in the original. Digging through all these maps are a treat. 
because you get to experience the full version of these maps with all their features still intact, as well as the arcade versions where everything has been sort of stripped down and simplified. Take a look at Lethal Leviathan. In the arcade version, they removed a bunch of stuff including things like ladders, but in the full version, it has all that stuff still included, and the interesting part about all that is that they all still work. You can even hang off the railings like you can when playing this section in MGS4 single player. And there's stuff like this all over all the maps. And maps that have water like Tomb of Tubes and Ravage Riverfront, you can still fully swim around and shoot your guns underwater. And funny enough, you get to see your actual gun's iron sights when shooting them this way. And that's the only way that you can actually see the in-game model. The only thing that doesn't work in the water though is being able to actually climb out. It seemed like that's one action they never programmed to actually happen automatically like it does with ladders or climbing over obstacles. It's so weird that they have those actions working but not others. Like take a look at this next map. In Virtuous Vista, there's these mounted guns that you can use. So do they still work in arcade? Why yes they do, they seem to work just fine. The only thing that they don't have is sound though. It's weird how stuff like this still works, but climbing out of water doesn't. Oh, and if you're wondering why I didn't mention the mortar launcher, it's because BV is the only map in Metal Gear Arcade that only has the arcade variant of the map and not the full version of it. So what's the deal with all these maps anyway? Why aren't they playable? The answer to that is just that they never finished them. While the design for some of them is there, the AI still don't exactly work correctly on them. It seems they were never given a navigation mesh for these kinds of maps. So a lot of the time, they're just standing there not doing anything. And not to mention, a lot of these maps have a lot of lighting issues, meaning that they probably needed a lot more work to finish them. Either that, or it's a quirk of the emulation. It's hard to really tell, but just looking at some of the gameplay, you can see that a lot of them either don't have their lighting done, or the lighting is just completely broken. So while maybe Metal Gear Arcade had plans to actually add all these maps at some point, it seems like the game never got off the ground far enough to actually update and release these maps. Crush. Mix. Burn. Looking back at all of the content Metal Gear Arcade had really puts into perspective what could have happened with MGO2 if it had kept getting updates. Whether the limitations of the PS3 or the low numbers of active players were the reasons the, the updates stopped, it's hard to say. But the fact that so much was changed for Arcade alongside with having the game run on Windows architecture leads me to believe that if MGO2 were allowed to re-release and be updated, it would have continued to improve in the direction that we see here. So while I do have issues with certain decisions, there is more good changes than there were bad. It's just a shame that all this development went into making an arcade machine instead of releasing a version of MGO2 for PC or something like that. The original vision of MGO2 was meant to be a 10 year long supported game. Maybe PS3 couldn't fulfill that commitment, but releasing it on PC probably would have. Maybe we will never know. Because as of 2016, the servers for Metal Gear Arcade completely shut down. Making all the arcade machines unable to connect anywhere and not able to save any of your progress since you need to be able to make an account. Thanks to Zoft though, I was able to get all of this footage and access all the features the game had to offer. If you also wish to play Metal Gear Arcade and access the community server, you might want to reach out to him on Twitter or Discord. I'm pretty sure he's the only one that has his own private server for this working, but if there's anyone else, I'll update the description. And also, keep an eye out for when multiplayer actually gets fixed. It may be a reason to actually continue to come back to Metal Gear Arcade and continue to play it. Until then though, I hope you enjoyed this look through Metal Gear Arcade. Give this video a like if you can. It took a lot of work to get through all this footage. And I'll see you guys on the battlefield.